Covering letter Terranum Nuncius is in many ways a kind of descendant of a body of work where an utterance, often an utterance from the past, becomes like the central image in the work. Uh, one can think of the Public Notice Trilogy, for instance, which in the course of the 10 years, say between 2002 to 2010, became three works where a historical speech is really at the heart of, of the work. But then there's a Covering Letter 2012, which is a, almost like a predecessor to Covering Letter Terranum Nuncius, where the central image is really one of a letter a letter written by Gandhi to Adolf Hitler just five weeks before the onset of the Second World War, urging him to kind of rethink his, his ways in the world. Covering letter Terranim Nuncius, the recipient remains an unknown other. So unknown and so afar that it's almost inconceivable because the, the recipient, intended recipient, remains an interstellar alien. And the contents of this letter unfold in the installation in, in sort of two or three different ways. One enters the space and there's the salutation, so to speak, there's the greetings. These are 55 greetings in 55 languages that sort of permeate the space. The other element in this work is this return address, you know, a, a map of our location in our immediate cosmic neighborhood where it was believed in 1977 that if 14 pulsars could point to where we are, uh, that could get the recipient of this letter to us. But clearly since 1977, we've known that there are a few hundred thousand, probably a billion pulsars in our neighborhood. So clearly no species are going to find us back on the basis of the 14 pulsars that were meant to signify our location. And which also brings us to this question about our own sense of our location in the world. The images that sit on the table are essentially the images that were brought together by Frank Drake and Carl Sagan um, as a summary and evidence of our existence on this planet. Uh, these images weren't uploaded as images because in 1977 you couldn't upload uh, that many images on a disk. So these were essentially encrypted sound files which were recently decoded by a California-based programmer named Ron Barry. Uh, and in that process of their circulation from image to sound to image, they've lost detail, they've lost color, and they've become kind of abstracted. And these abstracted images then become a kind of starting point for me to sort of uh, find in them this, this kind of a three-dimensional world that slightly moves in the presence of a moving viewer. And the table kind of pulsates very slowly with light, almost as if it's calibrated to the speed of a calm human breath. So the painting actually begins with a kind of drawing of a grid. Um, it's drawn with a watercolor pencil and thus while the grid sort of provides some kind of a stability and an order, the very act of drawing itself kind of disrupts the line. And thus, the smudges and spears that happen when you kind of draw itself leads to a certain kind of a subtle nebulous abstraction that becomes like a starting point for me to start thinking of an image. I think there's been a, a series of intervening works in the last few years that have had a bearing on the manner in which I paint today. For instance, the elemental drawings such as the wind studies or the rain studies, uh, with the wind studies where essentially it's the setting a frame of a single line done outdoors where the movement of the wind alters the movement of the fire and thus leaves an imprint of that time. Uh, sort of making the drawing almost like a record of, of the duration of the drawing in some ways, almost like a transcript of this conversation between wind and fire. Or the rain studies where descending raindrops 
uh, settle to create almost this kind of interstellar imagery, a kind of cosmic image, uh, in a very, very brief moment when the drawing sort of enters the, uh, the outdoors in the rain. Or the sightings where the image might appear like, like a deep cosmic vista, but what one is looking at is essentially the surfaces of fruit skins, whether it's an apple, a fig, uh, a sweet lime where the colors of the fruit kind of flips into its own negative, into its own inverse. And in that slip kind of reveals a range of images that were almost as if uh, resident on its surface, pointing perhaps to maybe where the fruit actually comes from. We can kind of forensically think back that the fruit is nothing but photosynthesized light that becomes a food, that becomes a body. And my work often kind of traverses these territories. And I mean, in the painting too, I think it's really through this circulation of pigment and material that, that I hope to kind of reach to images that point back to me. And of course, ellipses didn't begin as a single painting. It all began almost like little islands of abstraction. Um, many of which had begun parallelly while other paintings began, got completed and moved on. These remained almost like little uh, gestures that really hadn't found a full completion or a full cycle. And I guess it took some time for me to realize that all of these were kind of coming together as a single accordion. And it's only about eight or nine months ago that I began really seeing all these pieces sort of laid together into a single, um, almost like an unfolding visual diary. And many a times it's really the presence of one image that's really triggered another. And almost bridging in some ways what takes off on one portion of the painting that perhaps points in a direction where the other doesn't. Sometimes, you know, water might just jet through pigment and disperse it and displace it evoking what might actually appear on earth over thousands of years, the movement of a river, whereas in the, in the surface of a painting it might happen in four minutes. And thus the painting becomes a little laboratory in which one can play out those questions about the world, questions that are often, in terms of their time frame, they exceed beyond the scope of our lifetimes. So how do you think of evolution in, in, in a long arc? And I think in, in covering letter Terranum Nuncius too, I think the possible journey of this entire message well beyond our own extinction, I think really makes us think about our time here. And I think it also opens up this question about how do you speak to the unknown? How do you speak to the afar? And that, I think, should make it a lot easier for us to speak to the one that's closer to us in a world that seems really divided in terms of how there's an absence of vocabulary when it comes to uh, ideological divides, whether it's left to right or religious differences or political differences. And I think really to, to really think of the far as this distant other allows you to, I think, think of your immediate as really one in a way, and I think in terms of this very, very distant recipient, I think all of us become a singular planetary sender. <laughs>